back into our series, our 2024 speaker series. We are so happy that you are here and our speaker series um, theme is promoting a positive school climate for student mental health, effective data, systems, and practices. My name is Kleinita Graffenreid. I am a training and technical assistance coordinator here at the Uni University of Washington Smart Center. At the UW Smart Center um, and the North Northwest MHTTC, we acknowledge that we learn, live, and work on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people who walked here before us and those who still walk here. We are so grateful to aim to respectfully, respectfully live and work on these lands with the Coast Salish and Native people who call this home. This speaker series is, we are pleased to present it to you and is brought to you by the Northwest Mental Health Te Tra Technology Transfer Center Network or the NWMHTTC and the University of Washington School Mental Health Assessment Research and Training Center, also known as the UW Smart Center. And this is our one, two, three, our fourth in a series of six um, um, talks on school mental health. And um, if you've missed the first three talks, no worry. No worries at all because the postings, the recordings are on our website. So you can go. And in fact, Dr. Nicole Holland Sims was with us last month and her powerful um, talk is will be going up on the website if it's not there. Oh, I think um, it's either there today or it will be there tomorrow. So no worries. And uh, we will conclude our series um, in the month of April, but in June, I mean, I'm sorry, in the month of March, we'll have Dr. Um, um, gosh, I'm, I'm, Rhonda Neese, who is a friend of mine, not just a colleague, but a friend, Dr. Rhonda, Rhonda Neese, who will join us in March, and Dr. Sarah McDaniels, who will join us in April. Now, a little bit about our NHTTC network. Goals of our network are to accelerate the adoption of evidence-based practices and implementation strategies, um, to heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills of the workforce, to foster regional and national alliances, and certainly to ensure the availability and delivery of publicly available, free of charge, training and technical assistance. Okay, a little bit about the Northwest MHTTC. Um, the Northwest MHTTC um, and the UW Smart Center are a national leader in developing and supporting the implementation of evidence-based practices in schools, including prevention, early intervention, and intensive supports. So we certainly focus on multi-tiered multi systems of support, training the workforce, and advancing the research base. Again, the Smart Center focuses on research and evaluation, training and technical assistance, and community partnering and outreach. And we are finally here, what you came for. So remember I told you just all we need for you to have is your warm beverage um, to get you through the day. And Dr. Nicole Holland Sims is here to bring us our main course. Dr. Nicole, we are so happy to have you. and. You know what, um, last month's um, presentation, you knocked it out the park, you really did. And I have been waiting to hear part two of this series. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Grafton Reed. It's always an honor and a privilege to be with my friends from the Smart Center and that they trust me with their audience and have invited me to serve as a speaker. Um, so I'm very excited to continue that effort. Uh, part one, when we met in January, I felt like it was a great session. There were great questions. And so I would encourage that same level of engagement today that if questions come up or comments or some yes girl say that, go ahead and put that in the chat because that lets me know that what I'm saying is resonating and connecting for you. And so the title of today's session is Becoming. So I took a little bit of a, a thing from uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. She has a book about becoming, and it really has touched me in the sense of we're always evolving. We're always developing into the person that we want to be. And in particular, what does it mean when we are leveraging what we know about belonging to become that person that can create spaces of belonging for other people. And what I affectionately call those people are change agents. So what I'm hoping to do with you today is talk about 
the journey towards becoming that change agent. Many of us, I hope all of us, have that already inside us, but we may be a little stuck on how to move or what, what we should focus on or how much effort and energy can we put into certain things without burning out. So my goal today is to give you some structures, ideas, and strategies that just might support your development of becoming that change agent. Last time we met, I went over all of this, but I just always have to give acknowledgement to the people that make me smile. And so with that, I want to just shout out my husband, Ron Sims. Uh, we've been together seven years and I'm just excited for the lifetime ahead with him. I'm a mommy to CJ who is six and in kindergarten. And I do this work now even more so for him and creating spaces where he can thrive. I'm a puppy parent to Biscuit, who is a golden doodle. So if you missed the first session, I talked a little bit about him. I'm also an Indiana University of Pennsylvania alum, as well as a Millersville University alum. And I'm gonna take a shot just like I did last time. If there are any other fellow alum in the space, feel free to hit that up in the chat. Who did I wanna be when I grow up? Janet Jackson, I will always shout her out. And I am a Disney fanatic. So just so you know a little bit about me uh, before we dive right into the content. In addition to that, anytime I present, I like to give shout outs to women in my life and in particular in education, who I can call change agents, people that I look to as colleagues, friends, sisters that have shaped me have shaped education around me and has given me the power to dream out loud. And so I won't shout out all of them for sake of time, but I wanted to acknowledge them in this way so that you can see their names and know that they have made a difference in education. And so just to remind us of the description for today, this is part two. So part one was really talking about what is belonging in the workplace, how can we achieve it? How can we recruit and retain more people into the workplace so that they feel like they have a place in the work we do? So for this one, I really would love for us to be able to describe the value of belonging in the context of our own journeys. We are all on a journey. Self-awareness though, is something that's not always easy to engage in. And so part of what I'm hoping to do today is if you're not really comfortable with self-awareness to get you to that place to begin, because that's the way that we can get to transformative educational systems. When I think of folks like myself as a school psychologist by training, I know we have school social workers in the space, we may have school counselors, et cetera, mental health providers, we have to do a lot of internal work, right? In order to be able to support the, the people that we are serving. And so that journey is continuous. But what role will we play in creating belonging for every learner in those educational systems? How will we also create spaces where we disrupt disproportionate outcomes for students and improve school climate? So when we talk about disproportionality, it's really saying that certain students are experiencing our systems in ways that are not equal, that are not equitable, that don't provide what they need to be successful. And ultimately, how can we create and support change agents? So not only ourselves developing our own change agency, but how do we empower others to join in with us? And we talked a little bit about that in part one. So I don't know if any of you are Golden Girls fans. I am a big one. I'm an 80s baby. And I can remember, and I'm going to date myself, whenever Sophia Petrillo, who was one of the main characters in the Golden Girls, whenever she would begin a story, she would say, picture it. And she'd fill in the blank. And most times she'd say, picture it, Sicily, 1942. And she'd start telling a story. So when I thought about my journey as a change agent and I consider myself a change agent, but one that is not quite at a pinnacle, constantly growing. But if I had to pick a year when I felt like my change agency began, it was 2005. And 2005 was my internship year as a school psychologist. So I had just finished all my coursework in the Millersville University School Psychology Program. And now this is my first year of internship. And with school psychologists, you have to do a full year internship before you earn in our state certification to practice school psychology. 
And I can remember entering the school district for my internship. It was Harrisburg School District. Nervous wreck. Scared to death. Excited, but nervous. Excited to do something new, to learn something new, to be in a new role, et cetera. And I can remember, and some of you may be able to have your own story in your brain. That first day I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get an office, right? <laughs> and so I went into this elementary school and the principal who was there, believe it or not, and I shared this last time that my mom was an educator and she used to work in this same school district. The principal who was there knew me because she knew my mom. And I can remember going in and expecting a warm greeting. And when I walked in, she sort of just looked at me and I said, hey, I'm Nicole, I'm an intern. I was wondering if I was gonna get an office. And she was like, there's no space in this building. Mm -mm. There's no space for you to have an office. And I remember this feeling of how, how am I supposed to be a part of this school community? How am I supposed to feel welcomed here? And I don't even have a space. And I found out later that she made the comment to someone um, that was close to my family that that's Holland's daughter and I don't want her to think she can just have whatever she wants. I wanna make her work for what she needs to get. And I can remember hearing that and being angry at first and then feeling motivated to prove something. And in that proving something, I said, I'm a school psych intern and I wonder how the other young people, the students in this building might feel. Is that the spirit that's in this building? And how can I change the climate here? Because I have the power to do that. And that one person shouldn't be able to dictate the atmosphere in this building. That was a catalyst moment for me to say, we have to do better. And change agency looks different for every person, but that was a moment that told me that I didn't have to fall trap to being made to feel less than, but that I could empower others around me to create a groundswell to build about change. I'm sorry, bring about change. And so you probably have a story or a moment where you said, I wanna see something different in the world. And while that story may feel minor to you, it may not feel like this big, big event, it was one that has stuck with me all of these years because I felt like immediately I wasn't given a chance. And there's a lot of us like that. And so I just wanna remind us from part one of a framework that can be helpful to organize our work and how we approach it. So as we do that internal work, the HELP framework still is applicable. Last time we talked about it from a workplace perspective, more of a systemic perspective, but let's think about it from an individual. History, equality versus equity, love and pedagogy and practices. History, understanding and knowing what has happened before so that we aren't doomed to repeat it. Now, historically, from an individual perspective, you can think about the things that you know are your triggers, the things that you know make you smile. And as one of my colleagues shares, what makes you come alive? You know what those things are. You also know what drives you. And so when you think about shifting out of history into equality versus equity, then you have to have a mindset. There are a lot of us who say have an equity lens and some would challenge to say a lens you can take on and off. So I need that mindset to be there. How do I adopt that equity mindset so that I can see where there may be disparities and have that passion I have inside of me turn into action? All of that can be undergirded with the ability to love. And some may argue instead of love, say unconditional positive regard, that I can see the good in people, that I can see the good in what we're doing so that it has sustainability. And then that informs and influences the practices that I put into place or how I approach things when I show up. So the HELP framework is applicable from a systemic perspective and also at that individual level. Just as a reminder, I think what we need to do here is just simply articulate that belonging is the goal. Equitable practices serve at the foundation 
inclusive communities where there's inherent worth and honored dignity, that needs to be present in order for us to get to a place where people can experience appreciation, validation, acceptance, and fair treatment. All of these things are interconnected, but if we had to look at it, equity has to sit at the center so that foundationally it's sound enough to bring about the change we wanna see. As another reminder, and I think this was really helpful in part one, these are the five essentials for workplace mental health and well-being. And you'll notice over in the blue is social support and belonging. And we're gonna talk about how that connects to the purple, which is mattering at work, centering in dignity and in meaning. With those two together, that is a self-awareness journey in and of itself. So who are my people? Who do I connect to in a social support way? When do I feel that appreciation, that validation? And how does that resonate with me? What does that make me do as a result? Is my dignity being honored or are there violations to my dignity? And I'm hopeful before I wrap today that that's one thing that I'll be able to talk to us about so we're more able to recognize violations to dignity. And with all of that, do I find meaning in my agency to support change? So what I wanted to do is take a little bit of putting a quarter in the meter for a moment and just specifically highlight belonging. There's a great book called The Science of Belonging because for some, when they hear that term, they go, oh, that's fluffy. There's nothing to support it, et cetera, et cetera. There is scientific connection to that feeling that we have as humans to needing to be with other people or having that connection with other people. And so the author of the book says that belonging is the feeling that we're part of a larger group that values, respects, and cares for us and to which we feel we have something to contribute. Let's think back to that slide I just said, meaning, dignity, social support, belonging. And the second part of this is the word belong literally means to go with. And our species has evolved to journey through life with each other. And so even though we may be disconnected in a lot of ways, maybe in what we believe, who we believe in, what we think, what we value, inherently, this goes back to the dignity conversation, we need each other to get the things done that we need done. So belonging is always needing to be at the center of the work we do. How do we know if that's happening? There are two ways to approach this. Self-awareness, which we know is important and valuable, we're gonna take the bulk of our time talking about that. And the other part is what's called system awareness. I believe that both should be happening. What we often see though, is one or the other. And before we wrap, one of the things I'm going to introduce to some and maybe review for others are equity traps and tropes and how easily we can fall victim to those in our systems and also in ourselves. But first let's unpack what these both mean. So self-awareness, is the ability to have a consciousness that's reflective in nature of how you understand the impact of your implicit thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So how you show up, how you react and respond to things, what triggers you, all of those things, if you have some self-awareness, you know what those things are. Or as you're growing and evolving, you're beginning to become more reflective on how maybe I could have handled something differently. In addition, system awareness is taking that same reflective approach that we talk about in this self-awareness process and expand it. So this impact now thinks about the system and how that is impacted by a collective group of us humans in our own self-awareness journeys with our own triggers, our own things that make us show up in a certain way and how they impact the system overall. So both of these things interconnected can have a significant impact on the work we do. So how do we become self-aware? We have to know how our culture has shaped who we are and culture is a big broad term. It doesn't just mean culture in, as in race, ethnicity, culture can be national origin, culture can be religious. So let's think broadly. Our culture has shaped who we are, where we fit in society. And that's the first step toward understanding how those assumptions we make 
and the values we hold may actually impact the students we're serving. So I'll share a brief story. I was training and someone fell asleep in my training and I got very upset about that because the value that had been instilled in me by my educator mother was that people who want to learn stay awake in class. And so immediately my mind is going through this process of, I can't believe he's asleep in front of me and I'm trying to talk myself down. This is an example of how values and assumptions influence how we interpret behaviors or what we're seeing in front of us. That's one part. The next one is becoming self-aware means that we are able to recognize that we bring our own fill in the blank, race, culture, language, religion, ability, status, all of that to every teaching and learning interaction and relationship. We bring it, it's who we are. But understanding that other person or group of people is bringing the exact same thing in the form of what makes them who they are. So it's figuring out again, how can we be more aware of how there might be disconnects between those things? And so one activity that I wish we had time to really sit and process through with each other is what's called the social identity wheel. And in the book that Kleinita referenced earlier, I talk about this activity in the context of offering it to a PBIS team who is really embarking on making their PBIS implementation more equitable. And so the team engages in this with the facilitator. I would caution before I go any further, this is an activity that requires a skilled facilitator. In addition to that, I would not do it in a large faculty group. It's one of those smaller group activities that allows for a lot of processing and engagement. But I'm gonna give you a brief, a brief rather example of how you would go through this. So really quickly, if you have a moment, pull out a piece of paper. And as you're pulling out that paper, I wanna talk us through this. You see each one of those circles has an identity. And in those identities, you will assign yourself what identity you subscribe to. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute what I mean. And then I have a couple probing questions. So if you have your sheet of paper, great, you need a pen or a pencil. So let me give you the example. If I were completing this wheel right now, I would say my age is 43 and you fill in yours, whatever you want. My national origin is United States of America, American. My home language is English. My gender, I identify as a female. My ethnicity, I am not 100% sure on. Some of my colleagues can say, my family came from Poland, my family came from Italy. Because I'm a product of the African diaspora, I don't know that for sure. Now I did do 23 and me, and so that helped me get a better understanding, but even that is broad. So I would say I have people from Britain in my family, people from Ghana in my family, so ethnic, ethnically, I don't quite know. My race though, I identify as a black woman. My religion, I identify as Christian, sexual orientation, heterosexual, and then ability. I consider myself able-bodied physically, but emotionally, many would argue and I can self-diagnose, I have a lot of anxiety. So that's me, that's my nutshell, okay? As I was going through that, I hope you also were putting down your different identities and what makes you you. Now that you've done that, I have a couple questions for you. And thankfully we're in webinar, so I'm not gonna put anybody on the spot, but if I were in a training with my team, again, not full group, big group, I would say the first question would be, if you had to choose, which identities do you always think about? or that you're most aware of anytime you walk into a room. Some people would check, I'm aware of my gender right away. I'm aware of my age right away, or I'm aware of my race right away. Some of us may say, I never even thought about that. That doesn't make you bad or good, it's your reality. It's how you're able to show up. The second question might be, you thought about what identities you think about most often, now, which identities would you be willing to give away? And we typically ask folks to put an X through them. 
And whenever I've done this, I've, I've had the gamut of people who are quick to give away two things and they're like, yep, I'd give away my age in a heartbeat. Or yep, I'd give away my national origin in a heartbeat or my home language because I want to be multilingual. Whereas other people say, uh-uh, Nicole, what are you making me do? I don't feel comfortable giving away something because that takes away from who I am. Then the third question is, what identities would you refuse to give away, no matter what the pressures were that were put, that were put on you? And then people start to say, mm, I don't think I could give away my religion, or mm, I don't think I would wanna give away my gender or my ability. And it's up to them how they articulate that. And at the end, the culminating piece of this is when we think about our school systems, our educational systems, what identities do our students sometimes have to get away, give away simply because they walk into our doors? And then we have dialogue about that. This is an exercise in self-awareness and it's heavy, right? But this is a way to start unpacking those feelings of I am who I am, I'm still learning about me, but I'm also learning that others have to navigate the world maybe a little bit differently than me sometimes. And how can I make that world different where they don't have to do that as much? So I always say after this, when you take a little bit of a deep breath <laughs> and then move on. And so what I would like to do here is talk more about social identity. So in, in the same book that I'm referencing, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Erica Karuder and Dr. Tim Rungi and I, in one of the chapters, we talk about this social identity component and how we are developed as humans to sort of think in these ways. So social categorization, so sorting people by similar qualities into categories, social identification. So how do I identify? I just went through that exercise with you. What's interesting is that our self-esteem, our self-worth is sometimes tied to that group identity. Remember we said belonging is one of those things that as humans, we need it. And then we get into, once we develop that, social comparison. And what that does is it creates an us versus them, which sometimes and oftentimes leads to the biases, implicit or explicit, that we see. So a funny example that I'll give is I'm someone who loves Marvel. I love Marvel Comics as a result of having my six-year-old son. DC Comics, my son and I kind of look down on. So people who like Batman, Superman, not to say anything against you, but we become this sort of Marvel is better than DC Comics. And it's because we've sorted ourselves into a category, Marvel Comics, and now we identify that we're better. We have Iron Man, we have Captain America, we have Black Panther, and we start identifying with that identity. And then the comparison sets in. Now we have a bias against folks that like DC Comics. So that's just a very funny example of how we can break these things down and see how easily they can happen. So that leads me to what is implicit bias and what does that look like in action? So the definition that is offered here is that it's an attitude or a stereotype that affects our understanding, our actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. Most biases are implicit in everyone. Let me repeat that. Most biases are implicit in everyone. All of us have them. Often we are unaware that they're influencing our thoughts. And when, we're, when we realize we have them, we often get dissonance. What does dissonance mean? It's that internal conflict, like I cannot believe I was thinking that way. To know that that influenced our decision-making. So remember the whole premise of this session is about becoming a change agent and knowing yourself and knowing that to do that change, you have to be able to know where you stand on certain things and how you stand in certain situations. We gotta know these things about ourselves and because they're implicit, they're really hard to know. But once we know better, we do better, right? So one of the things I know to be true, like I just said, I have an implicit bias against people who like DC Comics. I just don't think you're at the same caliber. And I'm joking when I say all of this now, but let's think about that and how 
whether or not we know it, that may show up in decision making, that may show up in my interactions, that may show up in how I describe people and not even know that that's what's happening until someone is able to be an accountability partner and call me in. So how does this influence our decision? So my good friend, Dr. Kent McIntosh, he offers some ways that this shows up. Ambiguous judgments. He would say that ambiguity is disproportionality's best friend because ambiguity is subjective. The example is deciding between two job applicants who have roughly equivalent qualifications. You may or may not remember there was a, a study where resumes were given out. And those resumes had identical qualifications, but the names at the top look very different. One name might be something that felt ethnic in nature, as we say, whereas another name might seem more common. And no matter what, what they found in that research is that nine times out of 10, the person who got the call for the interview had the common name, even with the qualifications being the same. Snap decisions. So what we see in schools and in making decisions about discipline, because people are constantly making decisions when things are happening in front of them, especially in schools, where there's little time to really get all of the information, those snap decisions happen quickly. So for instance, this could be, which stranger should I sit next to on the bus? You're walking in the bus, you see certain people, your brain has an automatic association that this person looks safe or this person looks normal, I'll sit next to them. A snap decision because that automatic association is happening. There's a great video called Peanut Butter and Jelly for Bias. It's a short clip. And in that clip, they talk about how your brain automatically, typically, if someone says peanut butter, someone else will say jelly. Now, I've had a few people say chocolate, but they'll say jelly because that's an automatic. So when you see something that becomes the jelly to your peanut butter, your brain doesn't have to work really hard. It just immediately does it. That's the snap decision. And then unconscious behaviors, especially if it's a socially sensitive situation. So let's say there's a lot of people in an interview and someone makes a comment about an applicant's hair and says, how did you do that? And they go on and on and on, not recognizing the impact that those comments may be having in that situation, implicit bias. So I want you in the chat, if you don't mind, and we'll keep moving while you do that. Where do you see implicit bias impacting decisions for students? Or even in the work you do, it may not even be at the student level. How do you see that influencing what you see every day in the organizations you're with, in your everyday life? If you're comfortable putting that in the chat, please feel free. So I wanted to offer a way for us to mitigate as much as we can some of those implicit bias moments. And there's a great structure called the pause method. And I'm newer to this. I, I stumbled upon it because I, I bought, I have a little bit of an issue buying books and not getting through all of them. But there was a great book called The Inclusive Leadership Journal, which I cited at the bottom. Highly recommend you check it out. And in that journal, the author, talks about this pause method. And what she says is that it's broken down into five components, paying attention to your reaction, acknowledging your assumptions, understanding your own perspective, seeking the perspective of others, and then examining the options for moving forward and taking action. So we're gonna unpack each one of these a little by little, but I want you to have this because it could be something that you could keep at the ready when you start to feel yourself going down the peanut butter and jelly road, okay? So the P is to pay attention. So look at the situation and think about what you saw and what you may have overlooked in that situation in a, as a whole. And then consider your thoughts, your emotions, your physical states. Are you feeling nervous? Are you feeling your, your blood pumping a little faster? Are you feeling sweaty? What's, what's that feeling? Are you paying attention to your body? essentially, when that situation is occurring. So I can share very candidly that recently I was in a, a meeting and someone corrected me on how to say their name. And at first I was so appalled that I made a mistake and I started feeling that, that nervousness. 
And then I was also sort of upset that I was called out. I was having all of that internal struggle happening. And yet it was a learning opportunity, right? But in that first step, immediately that automatic association was, I can't believe I'm getting called out in front of people. And now I'm feeling uncomfortable and I'm nervous and paying attention to my body wasn't the first thing. I can reflect and now know what was going on. So that's the P. The next one is to acknowledge your assumptions. So this is what stories am I telling myself? So let's think back to the other example I painted where the gentleman fell asleep in my training. The stories I started telling myself were how rude and disrespectful. I can't believe he's doing this. I can't believe the people around him haven't nudged him or said, wake up. Now I'm starting to formulate some assumptions about them, not just me, about them that are next to him, as well as the gentleman himself. Understand your own perspective. So reflect on the past and the memories that are relevant. So once I was out of that situation or even in the midst, I knew that I was having a reaction because I had been taught that falling asleep was disrespectful. And that was a part of my identity, right? Because that was influencing how I was reacting. Even though I was shielding it and keeping it under wraps, I was having an internal battle. And then seeking the perspective of others. So what you may need, and I, I can't say this enough, is that accountability partner. <laughs> so that might be, in my case, folks like Dr. Kleinita. I have a lot of other friends that I consider my close folks that when something happens, I can pick up that phone and say, this is what just happened. Tell me if I'm crazy or not, <laughs> right? So you're seeking the perspective of others and asking their opinions and thoughts on your assumptions. And if you have a really good friend, sister, whomever it is that you connect to, they're going to be honest with you. You want that level of accountability because they're going to challenge your assumption. They're going to say, Nicole, I think you're going too far. Or Nicole, that probably is not how it went, especially if they were there. That can help you process in a way to check and to do your own self-awareness. And then examine options for moving forward and taking action. So in this case, it's determining what should come next. Does that mean an apology needs to happen? And if it's too late for the apology, let's say it's someone you don't know and you may not see ever again, what did you learn from it so that your behavior and the habits that you now have change? So now with me, I'm not saying I am perfect by any means, but now if someone falls asleep, I'm a little bit better at pausing and I'm using that kind of flippantly, but I'm better at pausing and saying, what if that person has elderly parents they're taking care of or sick children or they're sick themselves? They're asleep for a reason. Behavior is a language and it may not be for me to make a decision for that person that they're trying to be disrespectful to me. Examining the options for moving forward is so critical to this whole process because it's okay to do that awareness journey yourself, but the action that comes next is the main rubber meeting the road. Okay, so in another session that I've done, I thought this was important too because while it is good to know about you, you also, as a change agent, have an obligation and a responsibility to step up and stand up and speak up when you see things happening to others around you. And so one thing that I've, I've learned and I think has been so instrumental is this four-step process. Dr. Kleinita and I were recently talking about this four-step process, and in this, this does not mean that this is the end all be all, that you'll automatically know what to do as a result of using these four steps, but it comes from the great organization Learning for Justice. They used to be called Teaching Tolerance. And this organization put out what's called a speak up pocket guide. And so what's cool about it is it literally fits in your pocket and it has the four and different strategies on what to do with each four of the steps. And it's made for students so that they have a quick thing to remind them, to help them practice, et cetera. But I would encourage adults to also leverage these four steps. 
And so when we think about these four, the first one is to interrupt. So let's say that there's a group of us, we're having a conversation, someone makes a very inappropriate comment. And I'm using Kleinita because I can see her picture. <laughs> um, let's say we're all having this discussion and the comment goes to Kleinita. I'm standing there and Kleinita says, wait a minute, Let, let's pause, let's stop. Because I'm not sure I, I heard what you said. Okay, that's the interrupt. Number two is to question. So in this case, Kleinita may say, tell me what you mean by that. Because I, I don't know that I, I quite understood. Questioning is, in this case, disarming the person. Because if you go and you start calling them out or you say, I can't believe you said that, that was horrible, we know a defense will go up immediately. And then the conversation can't build. So she's questioning. They offer their response. Then the education comes in. So this is where Kleinita could say, you know, that term, a lot of people... For, right, for the right reasons, don't use those terms anymore because they're offensive. Do you know why it's offensive? The person might say yes or no. Let's say they say no. This is the time when Kleinita could say, it's offensive because, and fill in the blank. The fourth step is echo. And that's where I, as Kleinita's friend, colleague, whomever, we don't even have to have a strong relationship. But if I recognize that what was said was wrong, my responsibility and obligation is to echo Kleinita and say, you know what, I'm glad that you're saying this because I think more people need to know that information because it is offensive and fill in the blank why. So these are some basic strategies on how you can respond when there are comments that even if they're not biased, but they're just mean <laughs> or they just create a space that is not welcoming, this can be an approach that can complement the pause approach or the pause method that happens internally. And I'm gonna take a moment just to look at the chat really quick. Yep, okay, thank you. And I'm gonna do that when we are done. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. Okay, self-awareness was that first part. Remember I said these things can happen together, self and system awareness? So the system awareness component is what this looks like in practice. So how do we evaluate if we're on the right path? And the way that we can do that is to know the non-examples. What should we be able to, as change agents, what should we be able to know, notice, address, and fix when we see these things happening in real time? So. One of the great books that I think has been a game changer for me is a book called Street Data. And it comes from the authors Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan. And both of them created this book to really flip data on its head, to say there are all different types of data. And how do we become more responsive in our change agency? By listening to the, the data from the street. So essentially, the people the stories they offer, the information they provide, and that it's not just about the numbers. In addition to that, Jamila Dugan, specifically, created these equity traps and tropes to be aware of. So remember to know better and do better. So in that front part where I'm talking about self-awareness, that's the knowing yourself, becoming more aware of who you are. The doing fits here. So what I would offer, and I won't have time to go one by one, but what I wanna offer here is these are the things that you as a change agent need to be aware of so that your system can function in a way that does not lead to these. I also wanna add that you could substitute the term equity for any innovation that's happening in schools or your organization. So in some cases, it could be Oh, we do PBIS, taking an example from the first one, or oh, we do MTSS. And in this case, it's oh, we do equity here. The description is, the trap rather, is treating equity as a series of tools, strategies, compliance tasks versus that whole person, whole system change process that's really connected to culture, identity, and healing. So that work we did earlier in the self-awareness component that's missing. 
if we simply just say, well, we purchased a curriculum that does equity. Not enough, not sustainable, not in the root of what we're seeing. The next one is siloing equity. So locating the equity work in a separate and siloed policy team or a body. Let me put a little pin here. I'm not saying you should not have an equity team. I'm not saying that the folks that make up your equity team are automatically siloed. What I would encourage you to do is if you do have an equity team, take inventory that that team is connected to other teams, preferably leadership, MTSS, whatever other teams exist in that building, that the equity team has liaisons that can be in all of those as much as possible so that it does not create a space where these folks are on an island with no budget, no power, no nothing, just meeting to meet. That's the danger of siloing equity. Similarly with a policy, we know policy drives practice. An isolated policy that's not connected to any other comprehensive plan or strategic plan in your organization is pretty much flat in the water. It has to be interconnected. The equity warrior, I've been that. There are probably others in this space who have been that person. Putting the equity work and the work of creating a new system. So like I said, you can substitute equity with whatever you need to use. It's putting all of that onus on one champion or one person who holds the vision for the work and sort of saying, well, that's Nicole's job. She does that equity stuff. And then if Nicole were to leave, all of that goes along with her and the capacity hasn't been built with the rest of the organization or the team. As I said, I could go one by one, but I'm gonna highlight just a few more before I move forward. Spray and pray. It's engaging equity experts. And I'm gonna say something that may be a little controversial and I don't mean for it to be. This is a Nicoleism, <laughs> but I struggle with the word equity expert. The reason I struggle with that is because it's hard to be an expert in something that's always ever changing. And so that term cultural humility is really important to me. And while some may say they're equity experts and they very well are and can be, I personally stay away from that because I constantly wanna be in a place of learning. Nevertheless, a spray and pray equity experience is when you're engaging equity experts to drop in once or twice with no ongoing plan for learning. What I love about this, what you know, sold me on doing this speaker series is that it's a series. It's not a one and done. It's across a year. It's happened last year. So there's building knowledge across time. Navel gazing. So the equity work is sitting at a level of self-reflection and it doesn't go beyond that. So you may or may not have been part of book clubs or, or things where you sit around and talk about the horrors of what you see and hear in our country, in our world, et cetera. If all we do is sit and talk about it, that doesn't lead to action. And that's the danger of the navel gazing trap. Similarly, if we only look at the structure and we don't do some of that internal self work, then we're not making the shifts we need because we're not meeting people where they are. We think we know better and we're building the structures without the people we're serving. I could go on and on, but I wanted you to have a sense of the things you need to be aware of as you're self-aware, being also system aware of what you might be seeing and how you can chip away and in some cases demolish some of the structures that might be hindering the progress that you know is possible. Okay, so in the, the time that I have remaining, what I would really like to do is revisit dignity. So dignity was highlighted in part one, and we talked about the essential elements of dignity and how important it is to recognize the indicators for dignity, which are appreciation, validation, fair treatment, and acceptance. Well, where does all of that fit into this system and self-awareness process? So I just wanna remind us briefly of those essential elements of dignity. So we have acceptance of identity. Remember we went through that whole identity wheel. So expression of people's authentic selves without judgment, being willing to support that, 
safety, recognition, independence, acknowledgement, all the things that we know are pivotal when we looked at those essentials of workplace mental health, they really align quite nicely with these essential elements for dignity. But what I didn't talk about in part one were the temptations that we have to violate dignity. And so this is another one of those, I want you to just be aware of what you might see and maybe what you've experienced to make sure that you are always in that state of becoming a change agent. So these temptations were developed by Dr. Donna Hicks from Harvard and her book, Leading with Dignity. And it was also highlighted in the book that's referenced there, which is Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity by Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple. There are a few of these that are very self-explanatory. So what I would like to do is highlight the ones that really stand out. So the first one is to take the bait. So letting the bad behavior of others determine your own for the purpose of getting even. Now I'm gonna make you go on a little time machine again. Remember I said, picture it 2005. And that principal basically told me I didn't have an office because I needed to prove whatever. <laughs> I needed to prove to her that I deserved it. I could have taken the bait. I could have engaged with her in, in a not so respectful way. But I realized that that wasn't going to get me anywhere. But if I had done that, I would have probably violated her dignity in the same way that I felt mine was being violated. It happens all the time. So how can we take ourselves out of those situations? We have to look over our proverbial balcony and look down on those discussions and figure out when should I step back? What should I say that might save this discussion? That's one way. There are a lot of others here that I wanna highlight, but there are a few that stand out again. One is to play the victim, claiming innocence in failed relationships or failed rapport. We gotta be honest if we've contributed to some of this. And so playing the victim is a way to dishonor not only the dignity of others, but of ourselves. Seeking false dignity, that's over on the left, gaining one sense of self-worth from external sources instead of relying on our own inherent worth. And what the author would say is that if we are basing everything that we are and who we are on the accolades, the respect, the admiration of others, but we don't see it in ourselves, we're violating our own dignity and the dignity of those that are looking up to us. Another one that I would highlight is gossip. <laughs> and I'm not here to preach to anyone, but we do this all the time. We're hardwired, and that's what Dr. Hicks would say. We're hardwired to do these. So it's not a shame and blame right here. It's just saying that these are things we just need to become more aware of, similar to how we know more about the biases that show up in us. How, does, how do those biases translate into these violations of dignity? So with gossip, and I'll use an example that I've used in other sessions. So if you've heard it, forgive me. We're on a Zoom especially after um, we all sort of shut down. We were on Zoom a lot or Teams or whatever, Google Meet, whatever it is. And you all can remember probably being on a meeting and whether it was your director, your supervisor, whomever, someone might say something that's a little off-putting or kind of jarring. And you happen to see someone else's face in the screen and they make a face without even knowing it. And you may not know that person well, but you pick up your phone and you begin to text them and you go, can you believe so-and-so just said that? And that person responds, I know, I can't believe it. And you're now building a false intimacy because you don't, don't know each other that well. But now we're talking about someone in a negative way in an effort to try to connect. We're violating dignity when we do that. It happens. We're human. We do it. It's being aware and that's becoming more of a change agent when you're starting to understand what it looks like in action and in practice. So what are the indicators? Remember we have four indicators if dignity is being um, delivered or honored on the flip. These are the four indicators of what's called othering. So when dignity is being violated, we have otherized, mistreated, marginalized, and dismissed. So otherized, viewed, treated, made to seem different in a way that ostracizes, denigrates, reduces, dehumanizes. 
those things happen consistently and we may not even be aware. So when people say I feel othered, that's what they mean. Mistreated, dealt in a way that's unfair, unjust, biased due to perceptions about you, your identity, your group membership, conditions, circumstances, or your practices and norms. Again, this happens more often than not when we think about that social identity will and we're asking people to give away an identity to fit in, it's a form of mistreatment. Marginalization, rejected, pushed to the edge, kept or, or put or kept in a position of limited significance, influence and power, and you only can get belonging if you hide parts of yourself. So not only are you mistreating people when we're asking them to shed a part of their identity, we're now marginalizing them, putting them on the margins, and then dismissed, having your lived experience or your expertise questioned and validated or deemed insufficient. Those are the indicators of othering. I don't want you to put this in the chat unless you'd like to, but I offer a challenge by choice. A time when you experienced any one of those, what did you feel? And if it wasn't you, can you think of a time when someone close to you or even if they weren't close to you, you witnessed it, experienced any one of those four? When we want to become change agents, we have to be willing to tell some hard truths, to really understand the experiences of people and be willing to stand up when we see it. So how do these concepts influence our decision-making? There's a lot of different ways and we could spend a whole day talking about that, but there's a few things I wanna highlight. When we talk about dignity and we look at it through the lens of dignity, equity, remember I said is that core, we get a clearer focus on whether things are truly equitable. And so digni dignity rather answers the questions, why? Why are we doing this work? What foundation are we establishing? And this last one is the one that hits the most for me, not the what per se, but who are we working for? Who are we serving in educational systems, in our organizations? How are we honoring the dignity of others? So here's an example that comes from Dr. Hicks book. And this was a student in a high school that had a history course as they were talking about dignity. And she said, when students are treated with dignity, they feel safe to be wrong because everyone sees themselves as equally vulnerable individuals working on becoming their authentic selves. That is the value of using the lens of dignity in education. All equally vulnerable, right? That we all will not always get it right. We're gonna make mistakes. But if we can focus on honoring dignity, seeking not to violate dignity in the examples that were provided, and then create systems that don't fall into those traps and tropes, that would be utopia, right? It's not easy. It takes time. But to know better, we got to do better. Now, what if I have caused harm? So as a change agent, now I hope you all have put on your change agent capes or your hat or whatever you want to use. You still could make a mistake and you still could cause harm. You're human. Here are some things to think about. Take ownership. And if you can, be the first to acknowledge what you said or did. Own it. And what I would offer to is the authentic apology. So not if I hurt your feelings or if you were offended, but rather, I apologize for hurting you, period. Allow them then to respond. And if they choose not to respond, you at least took ownership. Determine how you'll improve. So what will that internal work look like? What lesson will you learn from that? And I love this one. Add time to your calendar to consistently take action, whether that's a daily or a weekly reminder. And in the journal that I'm referencing here, the author says, meet with your team. If you're a supervisor, if you're a director, meet with your team on those consistent basis and just say, I'm just checking in. Is there anything I could do to help you? Is there anything you need? I saw in the meeting, you didn't seem like, like yourself. Is everything okay? That's the way you can make sure that if harm has been, if harm has happened, you can address it. And I love this one too, and I stand by it. Use an accountability partner to check in on your progress because it's hard to know if you stayed with the work 
if you have the willpower to stay with the work because it's not easy. So you need that partner to help you along the way. And so the question that I want to ask you as I close my time is where will your journey lead you? Where do you want to start? Who do you want to start with? And what can you do today to become that change agent? Those are questions only you can answer. And with that, we are at the question time. So I'm going to stop sharing. Dr. Nicole Holland Sims, thank you so much. Um, I think what you've given us um, today is a lot to chew on. And I'm sure the lack of questions only means that we're still processing because there are so many nuggets we can walk away from, from the, the tropes to, and, and I'm taking screenshots of these because I'm like, I need to put that. And sometimes I take screenshots, even if I have access to the PowerPoint, because sometimes I might be out somewhere and I want to refer to it. So, so many great things. Um, my colleague Mary says this was incredible. I echo that so much, so much for us to think about in terms of our interactions with others, our ability to do self-reflection, our ability to stand up and recognize when things are going wrong and how we can um, just um, be that change agent. And so, oh, Tammy says, I took screenshots too. And guys, guess what? You don't have to because you'll have access to the PowerPoint, but Tammy, I'm with you. Sometimes I like to have it there so I can just pull it up. Maybe I'm in the bed at night and I'm like, what did she say? So absolutely. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Nicole Holland Sims. We so appreciate it. Um, any questions? Tammy said, I started saying no better, do different because sometimes doing better is uncomfortable at first. Yes. And my colleague says, sometimes we need to just sit in that stewy water yep. um, because sometimes that just is where we can get the breakthrough when we allow ourselves to kind of sit in that. So I am just full. Um, I'm full from the intellectual knowledge that I'm still chewing on and processing today. Um, Brandon says, as a white male trying to advance racial equity in a complex organization. This is very helpful for me and my continuous learning. Thank you. Ah, oh, Brandon, um, that was for Dr. Nicole. I am full from your comment because that lets us know that we are meeting needs here at the Smart Center through MHTTC. That, I really, that's, that's dropped the mic, really. That makes my heart really full to know that we are meeting your needs out there. And so, so glad. Um, Wow. Okay. So with the interest of time, if we don't have it, oh, um, is there a question in the Q&A? Okay. Cause I have my, okay, let's get to it. Um, how would you approach this within a district that is very siloed? Asked Mary. So Mary, that is a million dollar question for mm -hmm. sure. I think part of what I would want to know is the level of silo and the, I guess, level of system the silo is happening. So if it's across the entire system and I'm thinking district-wide, then where can we find the, as we would say, the volunteer army, which I've talked about in part one, or the guiding coalition that we can leverage to be the people to get the message out, to be more intentional about aligning the efforts. So I almost would want an inventory of what are all of the different things that are happening in the district so that we can start to make some through lines and see where there's overlap. And from there, once we know the concepts that are being overlapped, who are the people tied to those so that we can all get together at a table and start to have some really intensive conversations. Another thing I would add is that an equity audit is really, really helpful. And the Mid-Atlantic Equity Center has a free audit tool that if you just want an example, you can get a sense of the types of questions that could be asked to help sort of de-silo some of what you might be seeing, especially as it relates to equitable practices. She said, I love that. Thank you for that response. Um, sure. I'm gonna tell you guys, um, Dr. Nicole Holland Sims, um, what you see is what you get. She really is um, not just my colleague, but my friend. And she is my accountability partner, as she talked about. And I'm telling you, if you don't have one, you get you one. Someone who will tell you, girl, you are wrong, wrong. Where'd you go? Where, where, where are you coming from wrong? 
I, and then someone who will tell you, you know, you did the right thing and you're okay to feel the way you feel. And so I'm just honored to be her colleague, honored to be her friend and honored to learn from her. So surround yourself around folks who you can learn from who are still your girlfriends, but will also drop that good nuggets that you can chew on and process on. Um, coming up March 20th, please save the date for bullying prevention in elementary and middle schools, foundations and student ownership with Dr. Rhonda Neese out of the University of Oregon, another one that will hit it out the park. We're so proud of all of our speakers. And then in April, a um, friend and colleague Sarah McDaniel will join us with, again, continuing our looking at bullying prevention. She's going to look at bullying prevention in elementary and middle schools, leveraging experts in your building. So those things are coming up both in uh, March and April. And again, we want to just have a disclaimer. This presentation was prepared for the Northwest MHTTC under the cooperative agreement from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This work is supported by a grant from the Department of Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And if you need to get in contact with us, here are all the ways you can reach us with our website, our email, our um, um, Facebook, our X, formerly known as Twitter, for through MHTTC. And if you want to get in touch with us um, through the Smart Center, here is our Smart Center email, um, web address, and our Twitter, I'm um, sorry, X. Um, <laughs> you can get us on X. And that's it today. Thank you guys so much for spending your afternoon with us. There's a lot of things that you um, could have been doing, a lot of things that are, are waiting for you. But again, we we value and tell, take for granted you coming and joining us and spending some time learning with us. So thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next month, same time, same bat channel. Now, Dr. Ho Nicole Holland Sims, bat channel, Batman. Is that DC Mark? Comics? Oh, okay, DC Comics, and that's a, okay. Sorry, um, oh, there, there is a question. I'll oh, try okay. to be very, very brief. Right, um, you, you see it. Yep. So, in response to that, it was asking about the pause method. Um, really quickly, I would just offer that there's another strategy that a lot of us use in the PBIS world called vulnerable decision points. That can be a great way to introduce implicit bias. And then from there, when you're giving people what are called neutralizing routines or strategies on how to mitigate bias, the pause method could be a way of introducing that to staff. Thanks. I love how these things kind of interact and intersect each other. Yep. All right. Any other questions before we close up? Jimmy says, thank you for your okay. response. Sure. If not, guys, we want to wish you a happy weekend. And for our colleagues who are below the freezing line or close to it, stay warm. For our colleagues in Hawaii, hashtag jealous. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful um, afternoon. Take care, everybody.